good citizens of the reject nation in honor of Namor the Submariner entering the MCU and in honor of many, many comments on these videos, it is time to rank all of the villains in the MCU, all of them. That said, we are going to be ranking the main villains in the MCU, a couple supporting, but overall we went through all of the movies, phase one through four, all of the shows, phase one through four, and looked at who the villains were. So no, there are certain supporting characters that did not make the cut. I understand I couldn't get to all of them. I think it's 529 on Marvel Wiki, but the lion share, the big one, there's 63 in here. We're going to go through every single villain ranked by my experience with them. Let's get into it. Coming in at number 63, the worst, in my opinion, villain in the MCU is yon -Rog. This is because I feel like it was meant to be a twist, and it didn't feel like a twist. I feel like it was one of the rare times in the greater MCU that they were like, ah, gotcha, and I was like, nah, you didn't. It felt a little, uh, I don't know, it felt mustache twirly, and it felt like it was a little bit assuming of ignorance on, on the behalf of the filmmakers to the audience. I did feel like it was like trying to assume we were a little dumber than we were and I felt a little uh, underwhelmed by it. So some of these are lower because they were a bit boring or one note. This one is the lowest because it both felt a bit one note but also felt like uh, it was assuming I was dumber than I am and that that was a little insulting. It's nothing against Jude Law. Uh, I think that he had a lot of fun playing it and I'm happy for him. It just did not work for me and it felt like it judged me. 62 is Taskmaster. Now overall I liked the Black Widow movie quite a bit more than I think the average. I had a great time with it. I really enjoyed the overall experience and I loved especially the fighting and all of those elements that felt very Jason Bourne. I love that Scarlet finally got to play Black Widow in her own movie. I really enjoyed Florence Pugh getting introduced. There's so many things out of the movie I like. What I didn't like was the way they undermined what Taskmaster's powers are. I don't mind that Taskmaster is a woman in this continuity. I don't mind that Taskmaster came from the Red Room and has ties to Black Widow. What I do mind is by making her mute, by making her someone whose powers are programmed, you lose the character of Taskmaster. The character of Taskmaster is someone who can mirror someone by watching them that can basically have the almost mutant ability to replicate something. That's a really cool, unique ability that's then kind of AI'sed ai iodized AIs. And they also make it so the fun of Taskmaster is the playful banter, the, the mercenary aspect, the fact that you don't know who Taskmaster is going to side with, the duplicitousness. All of the things that make Taskmaster cool, the skull and the smarm, are gone if you make the skull kind of a, a motorcycle helmet. You get rid of literally the smarm in the dialogue and you make it so the powers are negated. So the things that make characters cool are appearance, powers, and, and all the things that they took away from Taskmaster. So I like the, the Red Room twist, didn't really like the rest. Number 61 is Aldrich Killian. Now this one is especially interesting because Iron Man 3 is one of my favorite MCU films. It's in my top third. And I think before the big studio note, this might have been a fun play on the character because originally it was supposed to be Re Rebecca Ferguson as the big villain, but Ike Perlmutter, who was running things at the time, wanted to sell more toys, thought men sold more toys, made the villain basically Aldrich Killian feels like very last minute. This feels like a studio note of a villain. So you've got a thing that feels very uh, paper thin. You've got a very mustache twirling choice. You've got a lot of things that would be fun if it was a mislead, like the other mislead in the movie. We'll get to the Mandarin in a bit, but the mislead here doesn't work because it's like, we've got all these mislead then land on and he's the bad guy. So it's like, we had the opportunity to have something really special. And then because of third act notes, it fell apart. And also for some reason he could breathe fire. I uh, that didn't work for me. So uh, he's gonna be lower. He is 61, Aldrich Killian. Love me some Guy Pierce, just not here. Number 60 coming in on the lower side. And this is one of the more controversial ones because it bums me out. And this is the one that I think is most expectation versus delivery. And I gotta say, he's lower than a lot of the ones that I'm just neutral towards because of my high expectations. One of my top 10 Marvel villains in the overall adaptation of Marvel comics ever is Kingpin. One of my bottom five in the MCU is Kingpin. I love Vincent D'Onofrio's Kingpin. I love what he does with this character. I love how he's utilized. I love how much he loves his city. I love that he feels like an exact mirror of Daredevil. I love that you're rooting for him almost as much as Daredevil and how that makes you feel as a person. I got none of that from the Hawkeye portrayal. I got a very, very um, comic book in a bad way kind of thin narrative where it's like he big guy, he throw, he powers. 
and it didn't feel like it was the same character. And I know we haven't really addressed whether or not they're going to be the same character in canon yet. There's been a lot of interviews, a lot of talks off camera. But whereas I feel like Daredevil really worked on She-Hulk by using like some of the charm and the playfulness and all those things to make him work in a different medium and a different genre that didn't land with Kingpin. It felt like a different character, even though it was the same actor. It felt like they didn't let him play the Kingpin. It felt like he was doing a, a more of a Saturday morning cartoon. And the thing I love about Kingpin is he's not that portrayal. So I'm very excited to see him in Echo. I'm very excited to see Vincent D'Onofrio going forward. Unfortunately, the portrayal in Hawkeye left a lot to be desired for me. 59 is Malekith. Now, Malekith is probably a lot of people's number one worst. He's the lowest uh, for a lot of people because they didn't really give Chris Eccleston a lot to do. Uh, he's one of the dark elves in the comics that is, is maniacal and dark and has a lot of texture and a lot of things playing with light and darkness. His face is literally split in two with light and dark, and there's a lot of uh, injustice in how he sees things. Here, he's a bad guy that does bad guy things. There's not really a lot of subplot for why he loves darkness, but he just likes darkness. So uh, this one didn't work for me because it just felt like they didn't give him a lot of writing to play with. And uh, Chris Eccleston is a fantastic actor. I would have loved to see play Malika in another opportunity, maybe in an Elseworld, maybe in a what if. Number 58 is likewise another incredible actor in another part that I would love to see expanded with maybe a bit more. And I also love certain elements of this portrayal. It's just some of these got to be low because others are high and that is Cassilius. I personally love the idea of someone being a religious zealot that is overwhelmed with this sense of right that takes them over and honestly i think the two major attempts at it haven't quite landed for me three now with moon knight but the three major attempts they have varying degrees of success out of those i think this is the lowest success for me because i never really felt the passion, I felt the idea of the passion. I felt it in the dialogue more than the, the, the delivery. And it's not an acting choice. It's just like there was so much going on in a movie where you got to introduce magic into the MCU. I love what Scott Derrickson did with the tone. I love what Scott Derrickson did with the world building. I loved all of those things. But I felt like because there was so much else going on, Cassilius got shortchanged. And I don't really remember what his motivation was. He hated Tilda Swinton for being a hypocrite. That's all I really remember. And that's not quite enough for me for a character that could have been so much. Number 57 is Laufey. This is the frost giant father of Loki. I wasn't even sure whether to include him or not. He felt like more of a bait and switch of a villain, but with Laufey and a character that is so terrifying that he sometimes intimidates the gods, I just feel like I don't remember him strongly enough, even after rewatching these films, to have that be delivered as Laufey. Now, this is very early on in the MCU. I don't fault it as much as others. That's why, I mean, I consider Laufey worse as, you know, uh, an intimidation factor than, say, the Kingpin but because I don't really remember it and because it didn't leave an impact, it's a little higher because expectations were lower, but it's just kind of a, eh, you know, Laufey was there. Number 56, The Power Broker. So this one's interesting because I wanted to feel the oomph of a reveal. And I really think that the tone of this show had a lot of elements that felt like espionage, that felt like there was gonna be a big twist, that felt like Falcon and the Winter Soldier was gonna end with something that was like gobsmacking. And I felt like they just maybe planted too many seeds. They gave us too many hints at that the fact that we were gonna be betrayed by Agent 13, that we were gonna get this, this moment of like, ah. So I, I a little bit felt like maybe the tone was too shoehorned in. So uh, this is a show that got a lot of rewrites because of COVID. This is a show that had to reframe a lot of their things and maybe that caused Cause this to be a little too on the nose, but I do feel like the power broker reveal kind of undermined the impact of how I wanted this villain to land. Number 55 is the Sovereign. Now, this is a set of characters that I'm hoping get some time to improve with Guardians 3, but with Guardians 2 doing a lot with Ego and having, you know, all those characters in the Guardians already, I do feel like the Sovereign felt like an addition in world building and a, an abstraction versus an actual threat. I never was really worried for our characters with the Sovereign. As cool as they were and as much as I love their imagery and as much as I love the casting, I really hope it's it's going to be more of a setting up Adam Warlock and then we find more about the Sovereign. It does feel like the, the part one of two of the Sovereign, so that's why, you know, I'm not really sure how to put these as villains, but when I think of the villain of Guardians 2, I've got Ego and the Sovereign and the Sovereign didn't leave as much of an impact as I hoped they would, hoping that changes in three. Number 54 is Curse. Curse with a K. Remember Curse? Curse killed, uh, you know, Thor's mom. Rene Russo is dead because of Curse, and that's about all I remember from Curse. That's not 
great. That is a secondary villain to Malekith, and I guess because the expectations were lower, that's why he's a little higher. He had a cool visual aesthetic, but he didn't really get to do a lot, but he got to count as a villain if you, you kill Frigga. So, uh, curse, 54. Number 53 is Yellow Jacket. Now, in the MCU, especially in the first couple phases, the villain problem was largely making the villain just the antithesis of the hero, which is a logical thing. It's what the comics do. It's what works and what doesn't. It's it's interesting because when it works, it really works. But when it doesn't, it feels very one note. And Corey Stoll is a very good actor. I love him in House of Cards. I love him when he pops up in, in indies. Even though he had one of the most graphic and intense murders in the MCU, he literally turns a guy into like splat and throws him away. I didn't ever feel any more of a threat. I never felt like Ant-Man had anything to go against him other than just like, that's bad Ant-Man in Yellow Jacket. So this villain just didn't quite work for me because I just didn't know what his plot was beyond being the antithesis. Number 52 are the Chitari, the Chitari in general. Now, groups of villains are tricky because how much can you really invest in? This was tricky to even include because I do feel like they are the villains in Avengers and they are set up beautifully in certain post credit scenes, but I never really knew other than them being kind of like worker bees for L Loki, what their goals were. So the Chitari had cool visual design. I love the different ships. I love the organic nature of the ships. That's why they're a little higher, but I never really got to know what the Chitari would want. And I always thought they were kind of a uh, parallel to the brood. Like when they didn't have the Fox licensing at Marvel, I felt like the Chitari could have gone brood. They could have come back. They could have done a lot more. And it's been cool to see their, their weaponry and stuff come back and be utilized. And maybe we'll still get more of the races of space, what these other species are, what their goals are. Did they want to invade us to take over our planet, etc. I just didn't really get that from the Chitari, so they're 52. Number 51 is the Destroyer. Thor 1 had a lot to do, where we had already brought in Iron Man, who is our most maybe approachable, not in personality, but in like a guy builds a suit. And then Captain America, we've got adventure movies, we've got nostalgia. Thor had to be like, hey, we got those things. We're going to add in magic, but only Norse magic. And you're going to believe in all this mythology and you're going to do all of that with this awesome, handsome new guy, Chris Hemsworth. It's doing a lot. So Loki is pretty much the antagonist, but he's kind of the antagonist of all of phase one. So the actual antagonist doesn't get a lot to do. So Destroyer gets a, a big old pass because he's just really cool looking and he's the puppet on the string. And he does that very well. I mean, he's, he's a big destroying thing. So Destroyer, 51. All right, top 50. This is a long list. Number 50 is Whiplash. You remember his bird? He just wanted that bird real bad. He was a, a product of Iron Man 2 feeling rushed. I mean, Mickey Rourke was coming off of The Wrestler, his big comeback, jumped on a Marvel movie. All the ingredients were there, but I feel like we didn't really have much in the way of the vengeance that was implied. Like there was a lot of revenge that was shown on screen, but I never really felt it. Like when you get later on to Winter Soldier and that revenge in the other direction from Tony towards something, that's earned and felt. I never really felt a lot from this villain that felt, you know, a, a bit more on the Saturday morning cartoon side. And I think it was a mix of the Rush production, uh, you know, a difference of ideas of portrayal, making sure we juggle all these things and setting up. Iron Man 2 is definitely stuck in the you've got to set a lot of stuff up problem. So I think this was just an early misstep for Marvel, which they then did quickly rectify. Number 49, the Black Order. Now, this is another group of villains. This is Thanos' posse. And the reason it's so low is I think they just didn't get the time to really be anything but a posse. The group of villains that work for villains, henchmen don't really get to do a lot. They're a little higher than others because there was some moments of characterization. There was a little emotional impact. There was some really cool visual choices and designs. But again, this is a list of 63. Something's got to be lower. When you've got this many villains, the ones that fall into the background around Thanos are just inevitably at 49. Number 48, and this one is hard to categorize because it almost doesn't feel fair. In a show that's dealing with cliches and is very intentionally going like, this is bad writing because we did this to, you know, make sure the audience feels this and these certain things. It's hard to judge any villains. But in looking back at my experience of She-Hulk, I did find I never believed what Titania wanted besides the joke of social media. So I definitely had moments where I was like, man, that's too real. And social media definitely impacts me like that. And man, doing it for the gram and all those things. But I would have loved beyond that one moment at the wedding of, of her having a real moment, if she's going to be 
be the main antagonist, which, like I said, she didn't end up being. It would have been nice to see a little bit more of that. It wasn't Jamila Jamil's performance, and it wasn't even necessarily the writing. It was the fact that she was, much like the Black Order, a side thing to the main villain. So she's on this list. It's low just because I didn't really know where else to categorize a villain that's kind of intentionally a distraction from the real problem. Number 47 is Lizard. We've got five villains in Spider-Man No Way Home. Amongst those, I feel like the one that didn't get the most time is going to be the lowest. Uh, Lizard got a few moments to shine, got some good jokes, but overall, like, Lizard's just going to Lizard. It's cool to see a little redemption for Risa Fons getting to come back from the Amazing franchise, but at the same time, when you've got five villains, one of them's got to not have as strong of an arc, and turning everyone into Lizards, just like the comics, is a bit silly, so hard to add a lot of pathos to that, and thus, 47, Lizard. Number 46 is Drakov from Black widow it is hard to keep moving forward with the mcu and have villains that are both getting the right amount of time but also delivering really strong message the messaging in black widow almost didn't need a central villain it needed someone to just pull the strings the abuse of women is staggering and awful and real someone just had to be the face of that because of that you didn't need a lot of screen time but because of that lack of screen time when he showed up, it was hard to feel anything except for hate that guy. And in a world as profoundly in-depth as the MCU, when a just hate that guy shows up, it's not going to be as high as other villains. So this character really just suffered from the theme was more of the villain than the villain himself. So when I say 46, Drakov is Adam Winstone. It's Adam Winstone. Good old Adam Winstone. Ray Winstone. When I say Ray Winstone this low it's more just the the theme worked more than the the personification of the theme for me not good not bad 46 ray winstone number 45 razor fist this is ironically a huge step up from the characterization of whiplash this is a very similar character if you look at it he's got these two things he wields them cool fights but here i feel like they use the henchman thing better like I think if Whiplash was a henchman, it would have worked. If they did the Thunderbolts and they brought back Whiplash, that'd be cool because it's a really cool visual thing, but he's not like a main villain, which is why the other villain of Iron Man 2 is higher. We'll get to that later, but that villain's great. The villain here, he's got really cool choreography. He's got really cool elements to him, and he's only kind of for that purpose. That said, can't be much higher because what I love about the villains is when they've got as much to do as the hero. Obviously, Razor Fist didn't get that opportunity, but I got to give him credit for being this high with just a guy with Razor Fists. I mean, full credit where credit is due. Now we're getting into the villains that I feel stronger about, but didn't feel like they got to do quite as much as they needed to to be in the top third. So we're about halfway through this list, and this is where they start getting good, but for something or the other, just didn't work out for me. And that's going to bring us to number 44, which is Najma. Najma was the villain in Miss Marvel, and this, much like the uh, Ray Winstone character, a lot of the themes were the villain. Like, it was generational trauma, it was the looking at family and how family dynamics can be toxic or strong, and there's a lot of things there, but I feel like with Najma, it was introducing so many things like, I mean, spoiler for Miss Marvel, mutants, as well as the veil, as well as introducing her powers, as well as setting up that incredible school, as well as setting up her own son, that I didn't know by the time we got to the delivery of her as the main villain, how much to invest in her. So I never really felt enough for the character to have her much higher as well as it was portrayed, just didn't get to feel a lot for her directly. So when she got, you know, phased and, and, and evaporated and all that stuff, I wanted to feel more there. So it's a little on the lower side. Number 43 is another of the five villains in Spider-Man No Way Home. This one's going to Electro. So this one's here because I really think Jamie Foxx found his Electro in No Way Home. I think they all did. I think all five of the villains finally got to give the portrayal they had wanted but I do find that as fun as the portrayal of a guy that's power hungry that has power of power like that's fun I love that greed that Electro had I did struggle with the fact that it was one line of dialogue of like the air feels different here so now I'm Jamie Foxx like he just became Jamie Foxx I enjoyed the power hungry Jamie Foxx but I would have loved a little bit more about you know the multiverse can change you or in this universe this is my it, it just it was the one of the times the multiversal problem wasn't a rest and I love No Way Home. If you follow this playlist, you know No Way Home is my, my jam. That's my number one. But that was a moment where I was like, ooh, this, this multiversal choice is pulling me out of the suspension of belief. So Electro, as the thing that represents that suspension of belief, is going to be lower as much as I enjoyed the portrayal. Number 42 are the tracksuit mafia as an entity. I am a huge fan of the Matt Fraction aha run of Hawkeye, and a huge part of that are the tracksuit mafia. My issue mainly with the tracksuit mafia is... 
we were all wanting some big bad that didn't feel like it delivered for me. We talked about that a little bit at the top with Kingpin, but the tracksuit mafia then, because of that erraticness, also felt erratic. They were funny. They said, bro, I got a lot of those things. They are, as you may notice, one of the higher groups of villains on here because I did enjoy that the fact they felt like the comic books, but they couldn't be any higher than 42 for me because that was their purpose, to be henchmen. And henchmen are never in higher top villain lists. So as henchmen, good job. As top villains, hey, you're 42. Number 41, another of the groups of villains and that representing a problem. And that also goes into Carly Morgenthau herself in Falcon and the Winter Soldier, a troubled production dealing with a virus plot when the pandemic broke out. These characters, I feel like were probably the most rewritten in post of anything, maybe in the entire MCU. These are characters that were gonna use a virus to implement their plot. And then we were dealing with a real virus that, you know, you can't really tell that story at the time the show came out. So I feel like these characters did not get to be what they needed to be. I do think it's interesting that we are living in the MCU that is now processing both how government and organizations can be flawed in their power struggle, as well as radicals that are trying to undermine organizations can be flawed. Because anytime you've got a power structure, it can go awry. So I love the concept of these Flag Smashers. I love the idea of it being the anti-shield falling apart, the anti-hydra takeover, but they didn't really get the chance to show that, and I don't think it's their fault, but it's gotta be somewhere 41. Top 40, and this one pains me to say because I think he's about to be a really incredible character in Thunderbolts, but so far I haven't gotten to see General Thunderbolt Ross get to be General Thunderbolt Ross. In the comic books, he's such a main part of why Hulk is driven towards certain things. He's this father figure that hates what his daughter loves and, and there's the power struggle of government versus this individual. There's the, the father-daughter struggle. There's all these things. And since we don't really have Betty Ross in the MCU, I feel like Thunderbolt Ross has had to be a guy that's just like the representation of military in the distance. And since we've got S.H.I.E.L.D. and since we've got all these other elements, I haven't really known anything of him except the Sokovia Accords. And that in itself isn't about him. So I think with the Thunderbolts and with Harrison Ford, we might see a lot more of Thunderbolt Ross that might completely change where he is but right now because I don't really know what he represents in the MCU he's just kind of there I like the portrayal number 40 Thunderbolt Ross number 39 is our guy that represents the evil Superman and this worked for me more than most Eternals works for me more than most but at the same time it's odd if Eternals was a miniseries if it was one of the shows and we got six hours with it I feel like Icarus would be very high I feel like what Richard Madden did with this portrayal I really enjoyed i felt the betrayal i felt his nuance i felt where he was coming from i felt all of those things but when i think back on the movie i think of the overall theme of uh f wanting to feel seen and wanting to understand where i stand in the universe and what we all represent as beings uh shaping the universe all those things more than i feel what his choices were to represent the eternals so uh, by by nature of what the story that had to be told Icarus is on the lower side as much as I really, really loved it. He's he's a highlight for me, but now we're into the stuff that I really enjoy that just, if this was a mini series, man, what Icarus could have been. Number 38 is Sandman. I love me a reluctant hero. I love me a reluctant villain. With Sandman, he's never really against Spider-Man. I love that throughout No Way Home, he's just distrustful. I love that he's got to do a lot. I love personally, as someone who loved the Sandman elements of Spider-Man 3, that we got more time with him but he's kind of just the guy that's reluctant. Like we don't, because of the movie juggling three Spider-Men and five villains, we don't get to really feel that moment like we do in Spider-Man 3, where he's like trying to put himself back together and the swirling, Th that moment represents both his mental and physical disarray. And I feel like we didn't get a lot of Thomas Hayden Church getting to play with that. So uh, because of that, he's on the lower side. I love this portrayal. I think it's one of the better castings. I think Thomas Hayden Church is Sandman. It was great to see him again, but it's just, I wanted more, 38. Number 37, I said there were gonna be more religious zealots on this list. The second of those three is Ronan the Accuser. I really like the idea of the Kree being these passionate zealots. It sets up the Kree scroll war really well. I think what they were able to do with his voice and his presence and all of those things was pretty powerful. And I do think it served to have a villain that, and, and I've used one note as a negative throughout this, because I think a one note villain doesn't typically work. But I think when you're dealing with someone that's mindlessly devoted, having this note when you've got the cacophony of insanity that is the Guardians of the Galaxy does work in this case. You've got one focal point, 
don't have to spend a lot of time on them. I've always said that team movies won't work in one movie. I was wrong. Guardian showed me you can do a team movie in one movie, but because of their centralized focus on one villain, you're able to have the team be the forefront. So Ronan works for me better than most, but he's not higher than 38 because I'm like, okay, that's what that guy does. Cool, he accuses, tight, and that's that's the whole journey. But dance off, little extra points, running the accuser. All right, we're into the top half, or almost the top half, we're at number 36. This is probably the one that's gonna get me a lot of crap from a certain audience, and it's uh, because I think that people don't, unless they're on the other side of it, realize how much of a problem this is, and that is just being a dick on the internet. I'm going with Intelligentsia as number 36. I think that what they were able to do with Todd Hulk and Intelligentsia is fascinating. I do feel like I would have loved to have seen the ramifications a bit longer. I would have liked if Intelligentsia was introduced a little sooner, revealed a little sooner, and there was a lot more than just like, we're taking Todd Hulk to jail. I wanted more of the consequences of the trolling because I think this show is about shining a light on cockroaches, showing people how shitty they are. And I wish there were ramifications to that because I think that's what those people need to see. So it's lower because I love the execution up until it was like, and we're wrapped. So Intelligentsia is our most real threat. There are people being absolute monsters people on the internet and that causes real mental and physical harm so I think that's something that needs to be addressed so therefore this villain is absolutely the most realistic villain but I wish there were more consequences shown so it's on the lower side number 35 is abomination I think that this is a character that if introduced in Thunderbolts again could go higher as well as Thunderbolt Ross because I love the idea of a super soldier that's just listening to orders gone awry that is touched on in Winter Soldier but it's touched on in a different way with abomination I I think Abomination getting even the comedic use of him being a guy just following orders what they did in S.H.I.E.L.D. It opens up a lot of interesting conversations. Add to that, they fixed the visuals and made him feel like the Abomination. Add to that the fact that I think Emil Blonsky is a fascinating character now and the fact that they're bringing him back from 2008. There's a lot that makes me put Abomination higher than I think a lot of people would, but he's now someone I'm fascinated to see more of, so he's got to be in the top half, Abomination. Number 34 is Arnim Zola. I love that one of the silliest characters in comics, one of the most visually preposterous characters, worked. I love the fact that he represents that like tech threat back in the Cold War era and that Toby Jones was able to be physically in First Avenger and then a voice that is threatening and actually causes problems for Captain America in Winter Soldier. Winter Soldier juggles so many incredible villains very well. Gotta give Arnim Zola some love. He's shockingly high at 34. Number 33 is Varusa. Varusa, I'm not sure how to say it, but she is so captivating, so immediately in Werewolf by Night. This is a performance-based love. This is an actress that came and knew exactly the assignment, acted her eyeballs out, made me hate her, but be captivated by her. I hated how she treated her, her husband, even in death. That weird admiration and longing should have felt I don't know. I felt gross, but also that was captivating. The way she treated Elsa Bloodstone, she did everything right, and you wanted to hate her. And she also felt like a 20s classic monster movie villain. It was so big, but it didn't feel absurdist because it was intentionally... Everything! Everything worked for me. Love this villain. Verusa, just, it's up there, man. That was a great portrayal. Number 32, Dormammu. We're into the top half pretty steady now. We're approaching the top third. This is a villain who is so, so hard to capture because of the abstract. This is literally a concept. And the visual Scott Derrickson was able to bring, the feeling of Doctor Strange just trapping this, this concept in a time loop, this, this feeling of purgatory, the paranoia that was able to be captured with Dormammu, I absolutely adore. Dormammu is a nearly impossible character to convey, and I think they did it. I think those visuals are still amongst my favorite in the MCU is just the sheer psychedelic trip of what Dormammu as a, as a visage would have to be. And vistage visage? Anyway, I love, love that. But I don't love that the existential threat hasn't come back. If Dormammu got to play some more, if he got to be more of a Thanos element, if there got to be more dealing with, you know, something that had to give up, but like was ruining the day for Doctor Strange, I want Dormammu to be back as a threat, then he'd be higher. But for now, that's where Dormammu lies. 31 and one of my probably more controversial picks, but uh, this is where the Deviant slash Crow reside. I think a lot of people didn't enjoy Crow, which was Bill Skarsgård in The Eternals, but for me, the Deviants represented us as humans. They were seen as primitive, they were seen as not intelligent, and you realize that the villains the Eternals were fighting were actually just things trying to survive, and they kind of became our eyeline, and I love that because this is a mov movie about humanity, and then there's a twist that humanity is represented by the villains, and that the people we're rooting for might not be the heroes at all. The end of Eternals is them sacrificing billions of lives 
or the lives they know and they like. And that kind of makes them the villains. But on the journey there, you need someone to identify with. So having a twist of being like, I identify with these deviants. I identify with these creatures that are smarter than we think we are. I, it kind of feels like how I think we would experience aliens. If aliens can travel interdimensionally, they're probably smarter than us. Because spoiler alert, we can't. And I think that they would see us as primitive. So I identified a lot with the deviants. So they're pretty high up here considering how much that movie juggled. 31. Number 30 in our most successful religious zealot character, Arthur Harrow. Arthur Harrow was captivating because Ethan Hawke was acting his eyeballs out opposite his buddy Oscar Isaac. And I think without that performance, the movie movie. I think without that performance, the show that was already juggling a lot of mythos and mythology and juggling a lot of things would have fallen apart. I don't love the final episode of the show Moon Knight because I feel like it went to the punchy kicky problem that She-Hulk then addressed ironically. But what I was loving was Arthur Harrow manipulating Moon Knight. So up until it became this big smash, uh, you know, Transformers-esque Godzilla thing, what I was focused on was the villain. And that that's because of Arthur Harrow. That's because of the performance. So he's really high up there for me. And I think if the show landed differently or if it if season two balances out in a different way i just love the fact that when you walk around you hear that that glass in his shoes and you believed it i love this show opens with arthur harrow punishing himself i love that his belief was so strong you believed it it's a fascinating portrayal got a lot out of this villain arthur harrow 29 is ghost i'm one of the people that liked ant-man and the wasp more than the first ant-man because i really was captivated by the villain i thought ghost was very interesting in that she just wanted to figure things out she was so earnest in it but then there was a maliciousness to it and i also like that ant-man is a tech-based hero and there was a tech-based villain in a non-linear way it wasn't like yellow jacket where it was just evil ant-man there was a different element of tech uh, i do think we're gonna be more endeared to this villain even more after thunderbolts i think there's a reason she is in thunderbolts ghost intrigued me i thought it was a step up from the comic counterpart very intrigued by seeing more soon number 28 batrock the leaper yes batrock this is legit one of my moments when I was like, the MCU can do anything. Not only is Batrock the Leaper one of the most preposterous comic book characters that shouldn't work on screen, not only did they give him a comic book accurate costume, not only did he leap willy-nilly to and fro in Winter Soldier, and it somehow worked that his power sets translated on screen, but they cast George St. Pierre, one of my all-time favorite MMA fighters, and it worked. Like, he is a French man named George, so is Batrock the Leaper. There's just so much about this that works for me. It's such a fun casting choice, used very well, and he leaps. And when he comes back in Falcon and the Winter Soldier, that was one of the most exciting moments for me. I love Batrock the Leaper. He'd be higher if I had no integrity. If I was like, yo, this list about my favorites, number one, Batrock. But I'm not that guy. We're gonna get to the top 27. It's gonna take a long time in Batrock the Leaper because I respect him. I love him. Thank you, George. Number 27, I am torn about this choice because I love this character so much in the comic books. I don't know if it clouds my experience of this character in the movies. I love Hugo Weaving. I also love what they were able to do going forward with the character by bringing him back, even though he had disappeared in Endgame. There's a lot I like about Red Skull, but I don't remember a lot of Red Skull moments when I think about First Avenger, and that's not a good sign. I think of Red Skull as this very ominous, almost Doctor Doom-esque presence, and since Hugo Weaving only wanted to do the one movie, Ross Marquand crushed it coming back. I would love to see more of Ross Marquand as Red Skull, but since Hugo only did the one, and then it was like 10, 15 years later when Ross came back as Red Skull, Skull. I just can't put him higher, but I think so positively of the Red Skull. I think they nailed it as far as being the antithesis of Captain America without being directly linear. A lot worked, but he can't be higher than where he's at. Red Skull. Number 26, and this list was made in honor of the final feature film in Phase 4, is Namor. Namor is probably the most interesting duality of adaptation versus translation on this list. That in Wakanda Forever, I'm not going to give spoilers just in case, but in Wakanda Forever, Namor is incredible at serving the purpose that Namor, the movie adaptation, needs to to make the movie work. But Namor, the comic book character, doesn't feel like Namor in the movie to me. I think of Namor, first word I think of is arrogant. And I didn't feel that with this Namor to the level I felt I needed to. I didn't feel the smarm. I didn't feel... Namor was likable. And Namor, to me, is someone that you're like, really, Sue, Namor? And then you're like, well, I guess I kind of get it in a bad boy sort of way. And I just never felt that way. I feel like Sue Storm loving Namor works too logically with this take. His kindness, his leadership, a lot of things about what made it work in Wakanda Forever are actually a detriment to the adaptation. But this is the MCU villain list. As a villain in the MCU, 
incredible. As a villain in the MCU, he served the movie's narrative and he made me feel all the things the movie was trying to make me feel. So like I said, this is literally the hardest one because as an adaptation for film, great delivery of a villain in Wakanda forever. As an adaptation of Namor, not how I perceive the character, but these are archetypal characters. So maybe my perception and Ryan Coogler's perception are just different. So I can't fault him for that. So I really don't know where to put Namor. So for me, Namor is 26. He's in the top third-ish because I really like what he was in the movie, but at no point did I go, that's who I've read for 30 years. Namor. And what a turn to go from Namor, one of the leads of Wakanda Forever, to one of my favorite obscure C-list characters that I thought was handled wonderfully. Shocker. That's right. Look at your villains list all over the internet. Where are you going to see Namor followed by Shocker? Right here. That's where. I love that not only do we get Shocker as a henchman in Spider-Man Homecoming, but he was so quickly replaced. I love that we got two Shockers. I love Shocker in the comic books, and I think the way to show his, like, ridiculousness is having him played both by Tom Hardy and by Bokeem Woodbine. I love that we got the experience of Bokeem getting to take on the mantle and that like I'm gonna do what I need to for money kind of character really worked and I felt intimidated very briefly by Shocker but I also felt like a guy that just got these gauntlets that he's going through stuff. I love the origin. I love how they tied in the Shatari. I love how it worked with Vulture. This felt like the exact right way to use a henchman character. That's why it's so high up in this. Not only do I love Shocker the comic character, I love this use of henchmen. Number 24, probably lower than a lot of people on their list, but that's because of my experience of her throughout the MCU, as well as my experience of her with the comic books. Wanda Maximoff is 24. If Wanda was introduced as the Scarlet Witch just in Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness somehow, I would have liked this character a lot more. Unfortunately, this character felt like it wasn't the Wanda we had just left in WandaVision to me. It's like we got 10 years of giving us steps one through one through seven and then this movie jumped to 10. i needed eight and nine to get to the scarlet witch i did not feel like we were with scarlet witch yet so when she suddenly literally turns around and black and white goes to color and evil is there it felt way too rushed for me personally i also felt that she could manipulate reality and a couple times she used her powers to go like pew 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 and like make finger guns instead of like doing cool like there's a moment in the movie where she like whispers in a guy's ear and it causes this this beautiful chaos that to me is wanda which is why it's as high as it is 24 is pretty high in the villain list because I love Lizzie Olsen's commitment. I love Lizzie Olsen's Scarlet Witch and Wanda. I love her portrayal and I love most of what they were able to do. Unfortunately, that leap puts it lower as well as some of the more linear choices with powers after she'd been developing them for so long. I want this character to be higher. I want Wanda to come back. I want to fear the Scarlet Witch more and I want it to feel earned. Number 23 is Gore. I almost switched these two and I juggled that for a while, but I think I had lower expectations of Gore because I hadn't met him yet and Wanda expectations for delivery and my experience with Wanda throughout WandaVision and earlier very high expectations gore I just wanted him to be intimidating and scary and Christian Bale certainly was I wanted Christian Bale to convey that malice I wanted to believe his hatred of gods I loved that we had in his opening scene so much earnest pathos. I love that this movie is as high as it is for me. The more I think about Love and Thunder, the more it falls down the rankings. But the things that work for me are how much the gods are arrogant and worthy of the scorn that they get. And I love at the end of the movie what happens with Thor for him to become a father. None of that works without Gore. If Gore doesn't have the emotion towards his daughter, if he doesn't do everything he does for love, and he doesn't have this feeling towards gods, none of that works. So Gore works as a villain in this narrative. However, it can't be any higher because he butchers zero gods on camera. I saw zero butchering. Stabs a guy, but there's no, they do all the butchering off camera. So he's intimidating when you see him, but I wanted like 20 more minutes of him. So he can't be higher than where he is. But with the screen time we got, I was impressed at how much I felt for eternity and for the gore we did get. Number 22. Now, admittedly, this one is high because it was our first villain. And I gotta say, I can't shake off how cool that was. Iron Monger is, I think, one of the better. Okay, the villain is the bad guy. The villain is the good guy, but bad. I think Ironmonger is a great example of corporate greed personified, and I love the duality of that because that's basically Tony's arc. He goes from a war profiteer to a hero that stops war. And I love that Ironmonger is if he never did that. Ironmonger is the guy that keeps profiting. Ironmonger is the guy that steals and makes his own suit. And yes, it is the linear bad guy, but good, good guy, but bad. But it works because Jeff Bridges is charming. It was it was our first time really seeing Jeff Bridges that way in, in this big of a movie. He's the dude. He's this awesome, loving guy. And I loved his villainous portrayal. Some of the lines and deliveries and the way he's intimidating to Pepper and all those things really work. And yes, it's the first movie. So there's a lot of 
of love for where this kicks off. Iron Man is still, I think, one of the best MCU movies all these 15 years later, and I think without Obadiah Stane, it would not have worked as well. I could easily see people not loving this villain as much, but for me, it's a very important kickoff to the whole MCU. Number 21, Ego the Living Planet. One, I'm very happy just to say that sentence. How crazy is it we live in a world where Ego the Living Planet is in a movie? Then how crazy is it that it's played by Kurt Russell? And then how crazy is it that it's a metaphor for parental failings, for arrogance, for gods and men, for what it means to be a father, to juxtapose what it means to have a son versus be a father opposite uh, Mary Poppins, y'all Yandu. I love that this is a movie of father and sons and that the father is ego. It adds a celestial element. It adds a human element with how much Kurt Russell is so invested in this character. I love his relationship with Chris Pratt. This movie falls apart without Kurt Russell's portrayal of ego and it ends insanely and bombastically and big. I think Ego the Living Planet is a shockingly good villain, especially with how much Kurt Russell is invested in the fatherhood elements. This this worked for me in a, in a lot of ways. Top 20, we've got Ulysses S. Claw. Andy Serkis is introduced in Ultron and immediately you can smell how sleazy this character is. This character is just ripping and dripping with disgust. He is a mercenary that will do anything for a dollar. He's stealing from the Wakandans. He's the only guy to get Vibranium out because he knows all the worst people. You know that immediately. Not only does he deliver that on screen in seconds, but then you get to actually invest in him. You care weirdly about his exploits. You don't like him, but you care. And that's Andy Serkis' charm. He's such an incredible performer. That South African accent is impeccable. The way he's able to be smarmy, but fascinating you lean into this performance there's so much going right and it's a character that has a freaking sonic cannon for an arm it is a character i did not care that much about in the comic books and andy circus made it so much more interesting and worked in both the ultron needs as well as the, the black panther movie needs he served his purpose in both and i was genuinely shocked when he died love andy circus's take on claw number 19 the return in no way home of dr otto octavius a lot of people's favorite comic book movie is spider-man 2 i personally am much more Andrew Garfield Spider-Man than Tobey Maguire Spider-Man, but I can also still acknowledge how important the relationship between Tobey Maguire and Alfred Molina's Doc Ock and Spider-Man is in Spider-Man 2. That is one of the most mature villain hero relationships we've seen. That's one of the most mature villainous portrayals we'd seen. So to have him come back, to have those moments of like, Peter, it's good to see you, my boy, to have him get to go full evil as manipulated by the chip and get to see Tom Holland use science to solve problems, to see a scientist rescue them, to see him go good, and you get to play around with a lot of of like what corruption is as portrayed by an actor. Alfred Molina nails this comeback performance. Doc Ock is still an incredible villain in this. I really enjoyed the duality of his performance and I love seeing him come back and get to play around with that again. Doc Ock's up there. Number 18, Ultron from Age of Ultron. I love this because it's it's a beautiful continuation of the Tony Stark arc. You've got war profiteer Tony Stark. You've got a man who believes that he is absolutely correct, that then overcorrects and tries to protect the entire planet by putting a, a shell around it. He, he puts a shell around his world. He ends up putting a shell around individuals that he loves by making a suit for Pepper, by making a suit for Spider-Man, you know, by taking care of his daughter. Like, he ends up accomplishing this goal in a, in a metaphorical way. But Tony's always trying to protect everyone by putting a shell around it. And Ultron is that concept gone awry. He takes over the internet. He sees the corruption of man. He, he has some logic in his belief that, you know, humans are a problem, a virus. You look at the Matrix and other things that are a commentary on humanity. Ultron does all that unfortunately and i love the delivery the voice and everything is so incredible it's a one of one audio experience but i did feel that it wasn't an age of ultron like the movie was like you know the weekend of ultron like i didn't feel the scope at any point and to me i know a lot of people have retroactively found a lot of love for age of ultron to me it was one of the first uh too big a bite like there's a lot in that movie that's a lot of empty threads that then luckily with 10 years were able to come back together but i feel like that quilt unraveled we've had to sew it back together and a lot of that was the overly ambitious goal which i respect ambition but it didn't feel like Ultron got to be the age of Ultron we wanted because of the other things they were trying to do I wanted to live in the malice of Ultron more and instead of getting the age I got the weekend of Ultron but the character himself excellent villain number 17 supreme Ultron yes the what if Ultron I think just edges out Ultron because he felt like the Ultron from the comic books I wanted Ultron to, but he wouldn't work without the Ultron from the movies. That said, when he takes out Thanos, when he does all of those things, that's Ultron. Ultron should be an absolutely shaking force to the entire universe. Ultron should affect everything. 
and I feel like this did. I feel like the Ultron we got in What If was the, the comic panel come to life, brilliantly delivered, very investing, very fascinating, though I'll acknowledge that it wouldn't, it's, it's, a, it's a yes and, it's an alley-oop, it's a continuation of, so it can't be higher even though I think it's an incredible villain because you need the foundation to get there. So it's like a sequel villain in its own way, but Supreme Ultron, absolutely decadent, great villain for What If. Number 16, US Agent. We've talked a lot in this list because it's a very common thread in comic books of hero villain duality. I think Captain America, uh, his his anti is Red Skull, right? It's like Batman and the Joker. It's not about an evil Batman. It's about Batman has one rule and it is, you know, not to kill. Joker is about breaking rules and chaos. They're not yin and yang in a direct way. They're more about like conceptually yin and yang. I love that US Agent is a direct antithesis, not like the Red Skull. He's literally a guy that thinks he's right. He's a guy that believes in a very different different America. I, to briefly get political, worry that there are people that see America the way that U.S. Agent does. I worry that U.S. Agent is a logical choice for a lot of people. I worry that the beliefs of this character are founded in reality, and that makes him a fascinating character. Chris Evans' Captain America is amazing because he made a character that is spangled work. He legitimized a ridiculous character so well. U.S. Agent takes that a step further and makes a scary reality flesh. He makes all the good that is what American can be, can be Captain America. I love Winter Soldier being a commentary, and it's not just answering rules and just following blindly. US Agent does. He just says, yes, I cannot wait to see him in Thunderbolts. I cannot wait to see where things go while being afraid of how real he is. I think he's an excellent villain. Excited to see more from him. Also brilliantly betrayed by Wyatt Russell, who's the son of Kurt Russell. Ego playing a dad and his son playing a US Agent. That's just fun. That's just nice. I like that ir irony. Number 15, top 15, you lovelies. This is probably the most prophetic villain in the greater MCU. This is a villain that I think we're going to have actual problems with this very soon. It is a villain that is portrayed by an actor who is both movie star and like giant theater nerd and only that man can portray this character. Mysterio shouldn't work. Jake Schillenhall just happens to be like this awesome theater nerd who's so cool. So like you've got a, a theater nerd character that is charming and charismatic. That's Mysterio. You've got someone you want to follow in this iteration. You don't follow Quentin Beck in the comic books, but in this one, they make him this likable Avenger, basically. You make him someone that like you want to be a hero. So so Peter realizes that and, and falls apart because he wanted to like this guy. He wanted to like have that parental figure. He's the big brother. He doesn't have Uncle Ben in this universe. He's got this big brother. He lost Tony. He's weak. He needs that figure. That's perfect for Jake Gyllenhaal. That's, that makes so much sense. And then on top of that, his powers are what I'm worried about. We've got, you know, uh, deep fakes around the corner to be not be able to be, you know, discerned from reality. We've got voice modulation that is already scarily accurate. We won't know in the next 20 years what's real and what's fake. And Mysterio plays with that. That paranoia is coming. I love that this is a villain that's prophetic, but I hate the fact that it's going to be true soon. You're so dramatic. <laughs> You're not scared of that shit? I'm terrified, Greg. I'm terrified. It's coming. This is our last election where we know who's running. We don't know what's coming, Greg. We don't know. Number 14 and probably my most controversial pick. This is a twist I adored that so many hated they actually disliked the movie for it. You've got iconography in the world. That's what comic books are. They're archetypal characters shown with beautiful iconography to make us feel things. Manipulating iconography itself to use as a villain that is in fact a shell is genius. Trevor Slattery as the Mandarin is inspired because it plays with our expectations. And that's what the world is, expectations about iconography. I love that he's a man that's branded with all this stuff to make you think he's this despot, this terrorist, and he's an actor. I thought that was so clever. I thought it was so well done as Sir Ben Kingsley. I enjoyed that twist so very much. I thought it was a way to handle a very difficult character. You'll notice the real Mandarin has not been listed yet because I love that then they alley-oop that with a way to fix a certain racial stereotype in a, in a fascinating way. But Ben Kingsley as the Mandarin is one of my favorite twists and so many things had to go right to get there. I love me some Iron Man 3, love me the Mandarin. Number 13 and very high on the list because the performance is immaculate. If you've got a bunch of people auditioning for Iron Man and you're like, man, this guy's so close to perfect. Where can we use him? We should make him the id to Tony Stark's ego. And that is saying a lot because that person's got to dance. They got to do a lot. They got to be a gun profiteer. They got to have orange hands. They got to be Justin Hammer. Sam Rockwell in Iron Man 2 is one of the biggest redeeming graces of that film to the point where I hope he's in Armor Wars so badly. I want him in Armor Wars so much. It's one of my favorite lost characters in the MCU. He is such a great Elseworld alternate Iron Man. He's so perfect 
and the whole time you hate how much you love him. That is such a fun villain. He's such a piece of crap. I want more of him. I hate that I love him. Give me more Justin Hammer. Top 12, you lovelies. We've got someone that was the villain all along. Another great twist. It was Agatha all along. This is a comedic, horrifying character. This is such a great performance by Katherine Hahn. I was so impressed at how captivated I was, how it was like second guessing myself like is she gonna be i literally thought they might have changed the narrative to make her not the villain and then of course she was of course she was they got me and i love that i love the use of the salem witch trials as someone from massachusetts i'll own my bias there i love that they were able to make her magic feel like a different element they opened up a whole new world i love the musical reveal i love how charming and interesting she was and how much you want to be agatha's friend and then how terrifying she was as a witch i cannot wait for house of harkness i was so impressed by this entire take on Agatha, a character that did not get the time to shine nearly as much in the comic books. Great villain, number 12. Number 11 is playing on expectations of the audience in a really fun way. You've got an espionage thriller and you cast Robert Redford. You're going like, oh yeah, he's the guy. He's the guy running things. He's the guy like making it work. He's the leader. He's the villain because you follow him. He's the villain because of audience expectations. He's the guy that believes so much in his cause that he obviously doesn't see himself as the villain, but he, when he's the head of something as big of S.H.I.E.L.D., that's what you don't expect. I love the Hydra shield twist so much, and it doesn't work unless you've got someone like Alexander Pierce played by someone like Robert Redford. It seems like such a small part in the greater tapestry of the MCU, but if you look at where we are now in the MCU, it's about heroes falling apart mentally, physically. They're, they're so overrun, and that all really kicked off with our lack of systems. When systems started falling apart in Winter Soldier, that quickly led to Civil War, which quickly led to Infinity War. Everything cascades from this moment, so a human in Alexander Pierce causing this is so wonderful and it's just his conviction and thinking he's right and to some people he is fascinating character I would never think looking at all of these names from comics I love Alexander Pierce would be in the top 12 but absolutely was thanks in part to Robert Redford top 10 you lovelies and the human that caused Civil War. I love Baron Zemo so much because Civil War is the first time we got that double page spread comic book moment. We got that insane airport fight scene that did so much for comic movies. And that was all orchestrated by one man pitting heroes against each other. One man with a vendetta that honestly, like he was a man that lost his family and nothing he did is redeemable, nothing. But you still go, man, he lost his family. You hurt for him just enough to go, man, that's interesting. Daniel Bruhl brought so much humanity to Baron Zemo, a character that literally in the comics is dumb enough to get his mask glued to his face. That's seriously he, he, his mask is glued to his face. That, that's real. This is not that. This is a captivating, fascinating man with conviction and evil in his heart because he's hurt and then you get to play with that further in Falcon Winter Soldier, where admittedly, little too buddy buddy, I get why it worked for the narrative, but I love that you're captivated by this man dancing. The only trailer they needed for that show was Daniel Bruhl dancing. That's Baron Zemo dancing in a club in Madripoor. The fact that the sentence I just said is real, Daniel Bruhl as Baron Zemo dancing in a club in Madripoor, that's real life, that's the comic world we're living in because of how good he was in Civil War. Love this villain, love to see more of him, hoping it's in Thunderbolts, big Baron Zemo fan. Number nine is the great and wonderful Kate Blanchett as Hela. This character is so impossibly captivating. You're both intrigued by what she's going to do next in a very jokery Loki way. You're both captivated by her origin and that you're like, well, she did kind of get screwed over by the gods, which is kind of what the gods do. You're also like, God damn, is that an attractive black tracksuit with green stuff that's so like slithery, sexy. Everything about this take in the character is so much. I love that the Asgard movies aren't my favorite, but the Asgardians are the most fascinating to me. I love what Loki does. I love what Hela does. I love the journey of mythology with these characters. And she literally did the thing that broke Thor somehow more than losing his family. He, she took away Asgard. She destroyed Asgard. She caused stakes in the MCU. She caused ramifications in the MCU. She caused us to know anything was possible by destroying Asgard through Ragnarok. Incredible villain, incredible portrayal. Wish we got more of her. Number eight is a villain we've met once. Number eight is a villain we're about to meet a myriad of times in different forms. Number eight is a man who basically monologued at us and gave us more exposition than maybe any other villain in a 40 minute window. He who remains shouldn't work. It is Kang, but not Kang. It's a preview of what's to come and about to be our big villain without giving anything away. It is a concept of the multiverse personified 
while being a Shakespearean delivery by Jonathan Majors in such a powerhouse performance that made Loki my number one show because in my opinion, it's the one that stuck the landing the most because of Kang. You tease Kang throughout this show, you better deliver, and then it's a monologue instead of a fist fight, and it's one that gives you set up for the entire phase five, six, and beyond. Also, it's a scene that largely takes place in a room that has ramifications for the entire MCU that there's moments that are still trickling out from. This is a crazy ambitious take, and they nailed it. I love He Who Remains slash Kang. We haven't even met Kang yet. That's crazy. I'm so excited, love this character. Number seven is my second favorite MCU movie. It's the title character. Dramatic pause for no reason. The Winter Soldier is everything right about when you make a movie and trust your audience. The Winter Soldier was a new character to comic books. You, you ask any comic fan pre-2015 if we're going to see Bucky come back, you doubt it. Like, he was Uncle Ben. Bucky's dead. Bucky stays dead. Ed Brubaker brought back Bucky as the Winter Soldier, and it was shocking, but I never thought we'd see it come to screen, and it wasn't that long later. It was a newish comic book, and then it was exactly right. It played with all of our emotion towards Steve. It played with all of our love for Sebastian Stan's take on Bucky, and it did it with some of the best action to this day in the MCU. It made you care about little details like the fact that he was trying to remember anybody bought plums which are good for brain health it had every little detailed nuance and at no point did it slow down it trusted the audience to be like plums ha it's funny if you know and you google it or it trusted you to you know recognize that the energy in the chase scene with black panther and captain america would be their different power sets it was like when you're a kid on the playground you dump out all your toys there's so many moments in this movie that hinge on winter soldier being so awesome you want to know how this fight goes he is incredible and has only gotten better but he started as a villain so he makes this list because he still has villainous tendencies he's still working through stuff i'm very curious how they handle him in thunderbolts winter soldier i think was one of the first times i went this couldn't be for anyone not just comic fans because of the nuance of this villainous portrayal number six we're getting up there y'all is mandarin as in the father of shang chi the real wielder of the Ten Rings. I love this character because he's in love. I love this character because I felt for him, like I'm not a father, but as a father, as a human, I felt for what he wanted. I felt his grief and his justified lust for power in so many ways that he self-justified. I felt Shang-Chi's agony towards him. I felt what it was to see him be corrupted by power. They did all of this with an incredible performance by Tony Leung, and they did it in two hours. This is an origin movie, not just for Shang-Chi, but also for an entire universe and the Mandarin. So they're able to bring us a twist on a twist. They're able to legitimize a villain that's very cheesy at times in the comic books. They're able to build an entire world while shaping it around this man. And they're giving us these 10 ring, which I guarantee are shaping the greater MCU to come. They did all of that and at no point did this villain feel shortchanged because every scene he's in is so gratifying and so uh, uh captivating in a way that you're like filling in the dots between scenes this villain's incredible and he fights on a dragon it's awesome love this movie top five you lovelies let's get into it first of the top five is going to be the great green goblin willem dafoe got to come back in Spider-Man No Way Home and deliver the comic book Norman Osborn, got to deliver the comic book Green Goblin, got to deliver all of that Willem Dafoe glory, and he got to be absolutely terrifying. You believed him kicking the crap out of Spider-Man, falling through buildings and smashing like Ultimate Goblin. You also believed his malice and that he thought, honestly, you're welcome. I just killed Aunt May. I just made you the hero. He, he knows the origin of his Spider-Man. He manipulates reality in his villainy. He literally kills Aunt May, causing the, the cascading origin of with great power comes great responsibility as delivered by the surrogate Uncle Ben and Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire. There's so much incredible, incredible delivery here that doesn't work unless Willem Dafoe, after 20 years of not playing the character, comes back and just gives it his all. He's funny when he's pocketing donuts. He's terrifying when he's looking up and snarling back at Peter after getting hammered in the face. He's intimidating when you genuinely think he killed Toby. Like, there's just so much right about this villain, and the whole time you don't know what he's going to do next. And I love the spider sense because he can sense something. There's just, I could rant about the Green Goblin performance for an hour, but we've probably already been here for an hour. This edit's going to be 90 minutes. This is a feature-length video, but Green Goblin right here magic. All right, top four. How do you top the Green Goblin? You give me a very, very 
very terrifying but subtle performance where one of the biggest power plays, two of the biggest power plays are dialogue, but that doesn't shortchange the action with your villain. And you do it with a character that I was iffy on in the comic books. I've always loved the Green Goblin. He's my big Spider-Man villain. It's like Green Goblin, Venom, Doc Ock. A lot of people have gone Doc Ock. Green Goblin's my guy. So I didn't have high expectations when they were like, hey, Spider-Man Homecoming, Vulture. I was like, the Vulture, really? That's a choice. Like Adrian Toomes is an old bank robber. You have a twist. <laughs> You give me the age-old twist of I'm your father. You give me the Darth Vader twist with the girl Peter Parker's dating. So you give me effectively the Green Goblin twist, but even more so. It's not Harry. It's not his best friend. It's the girl he likes in high school. There's very little as scary in high school than the girl you like's father, except when he's also the vulture. And most of the scenes of power are him talking. He overpowers Peter across a room by manipulating him to summon his glider effectively. It's the wings, but it's a glider giving you that goblin moment, but also the vulture moment. He also overpowers him sitting in a car, a comic accurate car, by the way, which I love, just talking to him with a green stoplight flashing on his face, giving you that green of the vulture. That scene between Spider-Man and Vulture, Peter Parker and Adrian Toomes, is some of the most Spider-Man stuff I've ever seen, and it takes place sitting in a car. The vulture, his origins being built into the MCU by him vulture scavenging the Chitauri tech, all of it being because of Tony Stark, you reinvent a decent villain and make them integral, tied to your universe, and then you manipulate them so fan expectations of the comics, this is exactly what you want out of the villain. Fans of the comics are excited because they got a twist. Casual fans get to be excited by a new villain, and Michael Keaton gets to act his eyeballs out as another person with wings. Top three! Gotta give it to Loki. Uh, Loki was number one for years for a reason. He is duplicitous, he is fascinating, he is charming, he is he is someone you want to like. He got his own show for a reason. He's pretty Pretty much a good guy now kind of but you still shouldn't trust him he will stab you in the back over and over again and you will still fall for it because he's so charming there's a reason tom hiddleston as loki was able to captivate the entire hall age crowd just coming out in costume there's a reason when he says kneel people do this is a character that you never know what's going to happen next that you don't know why you want to follow but you will without a doubt every time you believe in his intentions because he believes in his intentions the comic book has changed because of how much this character works. He's not even the god of lies anymore. He's the god of stories because the comic book is like, we like Loki. Like it's, it's fascinating the impact this has had and it's able to incorporate classic Greek myths and it's able to incorporate lots of other storytelling from other parts of the MCU. Tom Hiddleston's take on Loki is, is Shakespearean in scope and nature and what it's done for genre content villains. This is such a villain top three easy number two and number one are both interesting in that you can see so much of where they're coming from both of them are absolute monsters they're villains but starting with number two killmonger is fascinating because so many of his ideals are not only believable but enacted if you look at t'challa's choices after we lose killmonger he does some of what Killmonger was suggesting. Killmonger is trying to feel whole, but he's doing it in every wrong way. He's broken and lashing out, and he's, he's so fascinating in that you're like, that makes sense for what he's been through, but that's still not okay. He's doing a lot of things a lot of people believe in. He's doing a lot of things that people put in corners would do, and this is someone that's been abused his whole life, that's been left out in the cold, that's been kicked to the curb, you find yourself going like, man, does that make sense to me? And it's all delivered immaculately by Michael B. Jordan, who's one of the most charming people on the planet. You're so enamored by him, and he's also a physical force. He's also a physical equal. He's also someone that people follow for a reason. There's a reason that's like Daniel Kaluuya's character follows him. There's, there's so much going on with Killmonger, and I was so impressed by the way that the beautiful dialogue was able to flow just as much as his energy and fights, and just as much as Michael B. Jordan's presence in the room. Immaculate villain. Number one is the only one that I worry when people say this, they're not being ironic. Thanos was right, has become a meme in itself, because I would argue that since Darth Vader, or maybe including Darth Vader, this is one of the best blockbuster villains of all time, if not the best. This is a character that wasn't trying to end life, he was trying to sustain life by ending life. His, his goal, short term, was killing half the universe. His goal long term was making the universe thrive in his own messed up way. And that is so interesting. His belief structure was his flaw. Everything else was theoretically for a greater good in his own mind. That's what a villain is. A villain isn't someone twirling their mustache going like, I'm gonna do a bad thing. It's someone being so convinced they're right, they'll do anything. This is a villain set up for movies and movies and movies and movies, and then still overperformed. He got his own movie effectively in Infinity War. We followed Thanos on his journey as the Mad Titan. We, we, we saw 
to a point where he was coming from. I joke all the time that I'm stuck in the 405 in traffic sometimes. I'm like, man, Thanos was right. That shouldn't be a thought. I have, but it is, because that is so well portrayed by Josh Brolin here. And I also love that it's a fully giant, you know, 12-foot grimace that I believe in. I believe Thanos when I see him on screen. The special effects are so captivating. The mocap performance is so riveting. The reactions for everyone around him are so invested that I'm like, that's someone on screen. Thanos isn't real, obviously. But when I'm watching that movie, not only is Thanos real, but sometimes I'm like, man, what an interesting view of the greater universe. And you need someone of that scope, of that scale, of that conviction to be the conclusion of phases one through three of something so big. He set a very high bar for phases four, five, and six. I'm very excited to see Kang. Very excited to potentially see Doom. I'm very excited for all of what's to come. And I think without Thanos, the MCU wouldn't be what it is today. And I think without Thanos, comic book movies wouldn't be what they are today. And that, I think, is the best MCU villain, if not the best villain of all time. That is going to do what you lovely 63. I'm so tired. 63 villains ranked for your viewing pleasure. Please do not get in the comments and be like, what about Fenris the Wolf? We can't do all of them, but if there's someone I actually excluded that you consider a big enough villain, please do let me know. If there's anything you disagree with, please respectfully let me know. If there's any other list you'd like to see, like uh, maybe, I don't know, best fight scenes or uh, most uh, loyal adaptations of characters. I don't know. You let me know what you want to see in the comments. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Please do leave a like. Please check me out on TikTok. If you watched all this video and you're like, this is still interesting, you will love my TikTok, you specifically, because you've been here a while. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you to the citizens of Reject Nation. You are always so warm and welcoming. I appreciate you. And thank you to Greg, who's going to edit this for the next 12 years. Can we do this again? <laughs>